Three, two, one. Welcome in, Life in the Red podcast. I'm wearing red. Uh, it's not a Husker hoodie. I just, uh, it's a Heston Swathers. Heston Swathers, oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I'm I'm Chris. I'll tilt you down so you can see it. There's Palmer. He's going to join us today. Say hello. Oh yeah, Palmer. you are yeah. Herbie and then, Husker. Uh, there's, yeah, yeah, I'm Herbie Husker. <laughs> it's simple. Uh, Parker's over there. It is Friday. We're going to send you to the weekend with a podcast. It's currently 2.56 p.m. Um, into the bye week. For the Husker football team, going to get, get ready for Wisconsin next week. Going to get way, ready for Wisconsin without four of their offensive assistant coaches. Uh, four player, four men were fired uh, since the last time we potted. So we're going to obviously touch on that quite a bit. We'll talk a little hoops. Nebraska taking on Sam Houston State tonight. Uh, we'll talk a little baseball, a little breaking baseball news this afternoon. We'll talk about as well. So, all right, you know, let's get right into it. Uh, as we know, Scott Frost has fired four assistants, restructured his contract. Uh, Matt Lubick, Mario Verdusco, Ryan Held, Greg Austin, no longer part of the Nebraska coaching staff. Uh, Scott said the other day he wants to to move quickly uh, to get those positions filled. What what that means, we don't know. And that's kind of the question. We haven't heard any news yet. And I'll ask you guys, how quickly do you guys expect us to hear news on, on those assistant positions? Be right or go. Yeah, I mean, I think quickly in the grand scheme of things, but that doesn't – I'm not surprised we haven't heard anything – you know, so far this week as we go into the the weekend. In fact, the entire coaching staff is out recruiting today. Uh, so, you know, that's, I mean, there, there's, Frost sort of talked about this on Wednesday. There's there's multiple levels to his job right now. They're, they're trying to recruit. He's obviously coaching and he's also trying to fill four staff positions. Um, I think it's possible. Frost said on Wednesday that, it's hard to hire people in season because most coaches obviously have jobs right at the moment. That's true. I wouldn't be surprised, at least with an offensive coordinator, if they know who it's going to be and, and perhaps even announce it before Nebraska plays Iowa two weeks yeah. from today. I, it's not a guarantee, obviously, but they're trying to move quickly. And if they're going to have at least an offensive coordinator and maybe some other staffers, get out on the road and recruit, be in position to recruit the transfer portal, all of that um, as soon as the offseason hits. I think it's possible that there will be some news on that front next week or the week following. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Frost's job, it kind of, you know what now? Okay, so now we're in the final two weeks of the season, which I don't know about you, but it almost feels like the season's over, and I hope it doesn't feel like that at Memorial Stadium. It's felt um, like that for a lot of weeks, Sip. Season's been over for a while. <laughs> it feels been like over the since season late in the day I, on August 28th. As I sit here in my kitchen, it feels like the season's over. And I gotta constantly remind myself that we have two games left to cover. Um, but you know what? Frost, you know, you've referred to this sort of multi-task final couple of weeks he has, and it's always a multitask role for a head coach, but we know what you're talking about. And it makes sense. He kind of, he handled that well at UCF, you know, after he got named at Nebraska, you know, I don't know, was it December 2nd of 2017? 17. Yeah. Yeah. And then he went back and coached UCF uh, to a bowl win. He's coaching two teams and, at the same time, basically. Yeah. He was coaching two teams at the same time. And he was really, he was really, he really had to, he was really stretched then had to multitask. Um, there was that famous story of them flying out there overnight and overnight flight to get to Adrian Martinez and, and him throwing up at practice the next day and all that. I imagine it's about as stressful now as it was then. And, but oh, yeah. he came through that pretty well. So maybe he, he can come through this well. It's interesting too. I mean, I think there's sort of a, I was interested in asking him and did ask him on Wednesday if he, if he thinks that whoever he hires as the offensive coordinator will have some say in how the other staff positions unfold um, and who those people might be. And he said, yeah, he said, if I were being hired as a coordinator, I'd want, I'd probably feel pretty strongly about at least one or two people. And so that, I mean, that's a pretty clear signal that the offensive coordinator is number one on the priority list. So, you know, I've had a lot of people ask, like, who do you think will be an offensive line coach or who do you think will be a running backs coach or, or are they going to hire special teams, a special teams coordinator or whatever. And I think all of that probably 
spills off of who they hire as the offensive coordinator. And we, we can sort of maybe talk a little bit more about that. Like the conversation about the other staffers on offense depends to some degree on the specialty of the offensive coordinator. If you've got an offensive coordinator who also coaches quarterbacks, then you're looking for an O-line coach. But let's say they find an offensive coordinator who coaches the offensive line. Now you just need a standalone quarterbacks coach and running backs and receivers, you know, and then maybe special teams or whatever. So it is largely, I think, priority number one is clearly identify someone Frost trusts to be the offensive coordinator. And then based on the exact responsibilities of what that person's going to do in terms of position and all of that, then you figure out the next three after that. Uh, Palmer, is Palmer still in diapers? Uh, yes, simply he's 10 months old. Yes, he'll be yeah, in diapers. So, for the, for <laughs> so, so he could take a crap right now and we wouldn't know it. That's, no, that's, yeah, you'd have no, he might be peeing right now, as far as we know. <laughs> I really, yeah, that's good. Kind of fascinating. I'm almost um, to that age. I'm almost to that age where you're almost reverting back to being in diapers. Yeah, you're not far away. Probably. All right. Sorry, Parker. Go ahead, Baz. <laughs> I completely forgot what I was going to say now because you asked my <laughs> my son was still in diapers, but um, I don't. He's know getting his, uh, He's getting his you know temporary driving permit here in a couple of months. Yeah, he's he'll be he'll be off to college here for two months. <laughs> um, I guess. I think the interesting question is, you know, Scott said he wants somebody he can trust. Who might that be? Cause he's had a lot of those, a lot of those guys have been with him, you know, from the start, right. At UCF and, and in his time as a head coach. Now, obviously he's had worked with different coaches at Oregon and, and, and you and I places like that. But, you know, I, when Scott Frost says he's looking for somebody he trusts, how much do you think that does that shrink the pool of candidates quite a bit? You think when it comes to an offensive coordinator? I don't know what that means. I mean, I, I don't even, I don't know. I mean, I think not necessarily. Um, I think it's inherent. The, the, I don't think he'd ever hire a guy he doesn't trust. So yeah. Um, um, I think the interesting part of the conversation to me that obviously the offensive coordinator is important. It's not that much further behind in importance, the offensive line hire. I mean, what is the, I don't know, is the number one problem in this program, the offensive line? Um, they, they, and you know what? They, I thought they had a pretty good offensive line coach, so they got to go get somebody good because that yeah. is – I mean, I think that – it's my opinion. And you, you guys remember we were sitting in the press box in Oklahoma um, in September, mid-September, and mid-September, late September, and I said, I think that's the that's the – position group that's holding back this program, you know? Yeah. And I, and I still believe that. I still believe that. So that's a, that's a pretty important hire too. And you're right, Parker, it's linked to the, I think it would be linked to the coordinator. God, it almost have to be right. Well, yeah. I mean, okay. Let's just say I simple, you know, I, I have a coaching, you know, there's certain coaches that just like, I, I've always, enjoyed the way like Joe Moorhead, for example, who's the offensive coordinator at Oregon. I think his offense is really interesting. I find it fun to watch. He's interesting to listen to talk about football. Another guy who falls in that category. And I'm not, I, Joe Moorhead makes a lot of money and he's on a playoff, you know, calling plays for a playoff contender. So I'm not sure he's probably a likely candidate. Another one guy who's in a similarly good situation is Jeff Grimes at Baylor, but Jeff Grimes is an offensive line coach. So like if he, when he got that job, when Dave Aranda hired him from BYU last year, he knew, okay, I've got my offensive coordinator and play caller and an offensive line coach. Now you're looking for something else. So there's a lot of ways, but if you hired, oh, I mean, Tim Beck coaches quarterbacks, right? So if you hire Tim Beck and he coaches quarterbacks, then like now the fall, the, the cascade effect down is different. It just so happens that Frost has, since he's been a head coach, he's had a standalone quarterbacks coach in Mario Verduzco. And he's hired back-to-back coordinators that coach receivers in Troy Walters and Matt Lubick. So that mix could say the same or it could change. And that's probably something that you need to know before you go saying, okay, I want this person as a receivers coach, this person is no line coach so on and so forth. I think the trust conversation is interesting because trust can mean a lot of different things, but
But at the end of the day, what it means for Frost is that it's going to work. You have to trust that it's that you're not getting fired a year from right now. And so that could be, I go back and forth on how, how, how would you feel if it was you and you know, it's got to work. I mean, you'd be Mm -hmm. tempted to go with somebody who speaks your language basically right from the start, but he's who who maybe runs essentially the same system that you got, but he's also talked about the need for fresh ideas yeah. Um, and that would seem to go against that. So like, it, like the safe, the quote unquote, safe thing to do. I mean, Mark Helfrich knows this offense. They've worked together before. I'm, I don't know what their relationship like man to man is, but if it's good, like that would be, it'd be easy to trust at least from like a comfort level. But then again, like maybe you think, Hey, if I could find a more, I don't know, power run based person and, and, and marry some of our concepts together. Maybe that's the, uh, maybe that he trusts that that's the best way forward. So ambiguous term, but it has huge consequences overall. Yeah. That's a great way of putting it, Parker. You're a smart guy. I'm glad you're smarter than both of us. Um, hey, speak for yourself, Baz. I don't think that's no, I'm true. speaking for you too. No, no, you speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> the collective right. intelligence on this Zoom is just simply off the chart. It's off the charts, much much like the virility. Uh, it's also off yeah. the charts. <laughs> <laughs> wow! All right, should we do a? Should we just do a quick post mortem on the guys that were let go, and then we can kind of move on to the next topic? It's now been, gosh, has it been a week already since the those guys have been let go, which is crazy to me. Uh, well, I guess it happened Monday, so not quite a week, but beginning of this week feels like a long time ago. Again, we're talking guys that Scott Frost has known for a long time. Matt Lugit, Greg Austin, Ryan Held, <clears throat> excuse me, Mario Verdusco, uh, a couple of Nebraska alums in there in Austin and Held, uh, guys that real guys that know the program. Yes, Palmer, it's very sad. I know. Um, but yeah, I guess just your thoughts on what those guys, you know, brought to the program. Obviously, there were some shortcomings there with some of those positions. So as Scott said, you can't keep doing the same things and hoping for a different result. But I guess just kind of your thoughts on that group that was let go and what that kind of means. Well, in a sense, Frost fired himself, which is part of partly why this is all very interesting. He fired himself as the offensive coordinator and felt they needed changes across the offense. So naturally there's, it it all makes sense that way, right? He kept Sean Becton, but, but if he, if he wants a new offense, he had probably to fire most of his coaching staff. And that's the business, right? They're 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 staring down the barrel at perhaps a three and nine season. There's it would have been hard for Frost to come back to the fan base and say we're not changing anything on our staff. The appearances factor was enormous in this. I would think. I don't know if he was inclined that way. I hope he wasn't. You know, there's you know I don't want to get into that because it. Trev said what he said. Trev said there were no mandates um, right. he, from, from him, from the AD's office, that he had to fire guys. He portrayed it as Frost did this on his own, that this was Frost's vision. Um, I'm skeptical about nearly everything that Nebraska does from 20 years of dealing with this stuff. Um, you know, I don't know. You never know who to believe when this stuff starts happening. But anyway, it, I would say the firings make sense. Each individual firing, it makes sense from an individual perspective on each man, and it makes sense in a big picture perspective too. I mean, he 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 almost had to do it. And the one thing I would add before Parker weighs in here, from what I've heard, I don't know that – I mean, Lubick, I think – I don't know. I mean, I think he might have had to convince Lubick to come back anyway. So that one, I don't even look at. I don't look at Lubick's departure as as kind of a hardcore firing as much as I do the other three. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, first of all, I mean, I enjoyed covering each of those guys. Um, yeah, and me too. I don't. It's hard to. 
you make the blanket statement about, oh man, they're all great guys. I really enjoyed my interactions with all of them. And in the sort of superficial way that we get to know them, some yeah. maybe a little bit more than the others. They were professional, pleasant for the most part. Um, some of them are very insightful. Um, you know, everyone has their cranky days or whatever, but I, I enjoyed covering them. Obviously it didn't work. And, and Frost sort of said that. I mean, when sometimes when one, one or two plays go the wrong way, um, that's the business. And that's true. I mean, they just didn't win enough games to collectively to earn the right to remain wholly intact. There's one thing, Baz and, and Sipple, I've seen a lot of, not surprisingly, um, a lot of garbage on Twitter this week about like, well, just complaining about everything, which isn't necessarily new, but I find it interesting. Frost, I, Frost took flack for saying, and maybe even more than that, I took flack for tweeting a, a direct quote from Frost when he said that it was an easy call to make. And I think that sometimes people just don't think through this stuff all the way. I mean, like, just because at the end of the day, it was an easy call for Frost to make, like, I don't understand how anyone disagrees with that. Like, they're three and seven, you know, they're 15 and 27 in his career, like something had to change. And then if you push it even further to where if nothing did change, he was probably going to get fired. Of course, it's an easy call to make, but that doesn't mean that it's easy to do. Right. Yeah. Like action re was required. Mm -hmm. Something had to give. And, and I think everybody probably agreed that it was most likely if it wasn't Frost himself, that people were going to lose their jobs on the offensive side. That mm -hmm. isn't easy. It's not easy to have Ryan held, who is one of your best friends, walk into your office and have it be Frost and an HR person to talk about termination. Like, that sucks yeah. if you're Frost, if you're Ryan Held, if you're the running backs on Nebraska's team. But at the same time, like this, like, oh, my gosh, the media is, out, you know, saying how could they possibly write that Frost said it's easy? Well, he did. He said when, you know, yeah. if that's the sacrifice I have to make to have the privilege of continuing to coach here, which is what he said, then that's an easy call. It's easy because it ha something had to happen. This what's is your problem? Parker, what's your problem? <laughs> <laughs> this is what had to happen. I mean, it's, I, I, you know, it's a rough part of the job. It's not like anybody, yeah. it's not like anybody wants other people to get fired. It's not like Frost wanted, you know, to fire those guys. It was probably not, but I mean, when push came to shove, I don't think anybody's surprised that the way this year went resulted in changes on the offensive side of, of the ledger. I mean, they scored 50 plus in, in two games and in their other eight, they failed to score 30. It's just not, going to get it done in modern college football. Yeah. 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 I think, I think you guys nailed it. Um, I, there's not a lot to add. Right. Uh, and we don't need to, we don't need to spend a whole lot of time on this because what's past is past and it's, you know, you gotta, you gotta move forward. So that said, the next question becomes now can frost make this work? You know, there's, there's a lot of history out there that say coaches in, in a similar position to Scott Frost getting that extra year have not been able to make it work. Frank Beamer is an exception to that rule uh, at Virginia tech, of course, but you know, a lot of times we, we over the course of college football history, we haven't seen this work. So that, that becomes the question now. And it was the same question when he was hired back in 2017, can Frost make this work? Well, he couldn't make it work in this first, this first chapter, I guess, if you want to call it that of his coaching career at Nebraska as the head coach, now it's time for chapter two. Does chapter two have a different ending than chapter one? I think that's going to be fascinating to watch. It depends, of course, on, on who he hires uh, as his OC and, and for all those other positions. It depends on what kind of buy-in he gets from the players moving forward. It depends on, you know, everything else that hasn't gone their way this year, luck or turnovers or whatever it may be. But I'll, I'll ask you guys, can, can Scott Frost make this work with a new batch of assistants on the offensive side? I think um, it's a long shot. And if you want to, I mean, if you want to build intrigue in your mind, an interesting exercise is, is it's an appropriate exercise right now. I did it today and it's, it's really kind of fascinating to do is go back and watch his first press conference. First of all, you note how young he looks, how fresh yep. he looks. I mean, 
God, it's striking that part. Yeah, but he, also, when you age him like a president. <laughs> yes. Hey, that's a good line. Thank you. I used that it once in a game story, actually. Yeah, that'll. Well, I'm going to use it again as I it. I use a lot of Parker's <laughs> lines in my columns, so don't yeah. talk. Um, I uh, kind of your mo. Yeah, I just kind of let <laughs> Parker let other people do it. Ghost Rider. All right, Palmer, how's your diapers? I um. <laughs> well, I, I, <laughs> now, so if you go back Uncle and <laughs> if you go back and yeah. Um, I'm the uncle that nobody talks about, Mark. Yeah, <laughs> you're, the, you're you're the uncle. You're right on schedule. In in uh, two less than two weeks, you're up at Thanksgiving. You're the uncle that always. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, uh, not a stretch. Um, I, <laughs> the some of the comments that come out of that press conference are really germane today. I, I want to ask you guys a question. Um, Moose, uh, Bill Moose, in introducing Frost said, I believe he was everybody's first choice. There were other schools that were hiring. And I think he was Florida's first choice. And you remember Bill had that famous line, I got the pick of the litter. Um, and everybody yeah. clapped. Now, think about Frost back then. And then fast forward to now, he's, he's run through two offensive coordinators. He's only had one quarterback, but he's had two offensive coordinators, which is sort of interesting in itself. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and he where could theoretically be on... OC number three with the same quarterback next year. That, oh, yeah, that is not what that was not the plan. Right. <laughs> yeah, I imagine not. Remember, now, remember when Adrian was a freshman? We're like, man, he might only be here for a couple of years. Yeah, three and out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so the question I have for you, it's not really answering that question. It's another question. Where would you rank Frost in the Big Ten right now in coaches, as far as coaches go? Well, I mean, if you're going well, the record doesn't lie. Right? Just go bottom to top because that'd be the most convenient thing to do, right? I mean, gee, I'm trying to think. Who's, who's below him? I mean, Tom, Tom Allen, you Tom would Allen, have maybe? been crazy. You would have been crazy last year as they got it going. And the Maryland coach is below him. Yeah, yeah Loxley. Yeah, Loxley. Mike Loxley. But Shiano has done good work at Rutgers and has a reputation for doing good work at Rutgers. Um, Brett Bielema beat two ranked teams so far in his Brett first year. Two ranked teams, um, and beat Nebraska. Fitzgerald's had a rough year this year at Northwestern, but we we all know what he's done with that program. Again, the record speaks for itself there. So, I mean, those are those are Nebraska's contemporaries essentially. Chris at Wisconsin, we know what he's done. Uh, so we certainly know what PJ Flex done at Minnesota and what he's done in Nebraska, say for that first year. So Gianno, yeah, for some I mean, reason, decided it was a good idea to try to rebuild Rutgers a second time. Oh, man. Now, you know, the Maryland discussion is sort of interesting because they have they, they will not win this week. Um, I think they play Michigan State this week, but they have a chance to be bowl eligible next week when they play Rutgers. So Maryland could theoretically get to a bowl. Yeah. Um, his so, record in the Big Ten, or his record overall, Loxley's record overall at Maryland is eleven and twenty-one. This is his third year, um, and he's six and twenty in the Big Ten. Frost is ten and twenty. Ten and twenty-three. Yeah, yeah, ten and twenty-three. Similar. I mean, it's they're similar records-wise. Frost obviously has one year. So, one, yeah, yeah. So, in a nutshell, Frost is. I mean, we never would have thought on December 3rd of 2017 when he was sitting there being introduced, Parker, you were there, Baz, you were there. The room was full. There was so much anticipation. And you never would have dreamed it would have come to this. Now, in, you know, in the middle of year four, or tail end of year four, he's got to make staff changes. And now we're talking about what are the chances that he can salvage this somehow and and make and make it keep going. You know, it's almost like, it's not a reset because Trev won't call. He didn't. Trev didn't want to call it a reset because I would suggest Frost might get three or four more years to make it work. It's not that situation. So I'm telling you, it's a long shot. I don't know. I'm not smart enough. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna pretend like I'm smart enough to say how he's gonna make it work, except the obvious. Uh, the obvious. He's got to hire an offensive coordinator who, who can hit the ground running. Who's probably got experience, um, a lot of a wealth of experience as an offensive coordinator. Maybe he's even a head, maybe even as a head coach, and that system. I just keep saying it over and over. It's got to fit the personnel. I think that might be the most important thing. The system has to fit the personnel. You can't bring a guy in here 
with a system that doesn't fit these guys because um, that's a waste of time and they don't and they don't have much time. Yeah, you, you, this isn't a deal where you can bring in a totally different offense and spend two years recruiting to it and, and all those right. sorts of things. It has to be exactly. There's also, I mean, there's another way to, to measure with the pay cut that Frost took in 2022. Loxley, Mike Loxley is the only coach in the Big Ten that's going to make less money um, in 2022 than Frost. Four million puts him 13th uh, in the Big Ten pending. That's pretty amazing. Changes. So there's yeah. that there's that element of it too. I think if you're talking about the likelihood that it works, I mean, you can find some success stories. Other side of the ball, but Jeff Brom – you know, they had Bob Diaco for one year. They were a disaster in 2020 defensively. Um, he changed coordinators for the second time in as many years, shuffled his whole defensive staff, and they're pretty darn good on defense this year. Purdue's, you know, top ranked, um, not not the very top of the Big Ten, but near the top of the league and, and stacks up well nationally um, in a lot of categories. And I think Sipple talks about this all the time. It really helps that they have a – lottery pick for lack of a better term on that side of the ball and George Karloftis and other good players and all that. So, I mean, it's not impossible to make changes on the run. I mean, you've seen, you know, Alabama is a hard example to use just because there's, it's so different um, not only at the head coaching position with Saban, but, but just in terms of talent, you can churn through coordinators and turn things over and have it work. Okay. You can do that. It doesn't matter if you're Purdue or Alabama. But the stars have to align, and it's not easy. Um, and it's Different. certainly not going to be easy, you know, for, for yeah. Scott and, and whoever, whichever guys he hires over the next few months. Different situation, of course, but Frank Solich did it in Nebraska. Um, <laughs> he got fired at the end of a 10-3 and three season. So, so, obviously, slightly different. But it's, you know, there's precedence for it here yep. uh, as well, at least for one season. So um, we're going to move on to hoops a little bit here. Nebraska playing Sam Houston State tonight. Nebraska's 0-1. I don't think anybody saw that coming, not least of which was the coach, Fred Hoiberg. And we we all saw it. Nebraska struggled mightily to rebound the ball. Nebraska struggled mightily on offense. They were stagnant. It was a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, uh, the, the beautiful ball movement, player movement that we saw in the exhibition games. And that impressive exhibition went over Colorado wasn't there. And all of a sudden, this is a team with a lot of questions to answer one game into the season and going into a game tonight where they're playing a Sam Houston team that's ranked 30 spots ahead of Western Illinois in the Ken Palm, um, even after Western Illinois win at Nebraska. So it's not easy tonight. It's a team that wants to crash the boards. Nebraska's got a rebounding problem. And Sipple, you talk about this a lot, and I agree with you. Rebounding is about effort. It's about one to. Um, Western Illinois had a 6-2 guard that got eight rebounds the other night. It's not like Nebraska was getting beat because – Western Illinois had this great size and was just powerful and all these, they just, they just got outworked and they got outworked almost every time down the court. And, and even on that last shot, that last three pointer that Western Illinois made, if you go back and watch the video, if he had missed that shot, Western Illinois had three guys in position to grab an offensive rebound and put it back into tie. You know, it, it went right down to the, to the end of the game and it has to change. It has to change because we all know what the big Ten's about. And if you think, Western Illinois, abuse Nebraska on the glass. What's Purdue going to do? What's Michigan State going to do? What's Indiana going to do? You know, it's it's going to cost them games. And it cost them a game the other night, that and the, the stagnant offense. So there's, there's serious questions to answer there with regards to effort, with regards to want to when it comes to rebound. And I'm not going to question how hard a kid tries or how hard a kid plays or anything like that. But, again, rebounding is want to. You have to want to go do it. And so Nebraska's got, I think, got to show some toughness tonight and, and show some better execution or else, you know, 0-2 is a very distinct possibility if they play like they did the other night. And Nebraska's not a real big team either, so they really do got to – they have They're to – They're not. They're not, you know. but Western Illinois is not a huge team. They had a couple 6'10 guys. But, again, they had a 6'2 guard that grabbed eight rebounds, you know. So size plays a, plays a role, certainly, but they got to figure it out. And I, I've talked about this a couple times. Fred Hoiberg's tone in that post game just really struck me. Um, it, it, I don't, and it, this is going to sound like hyperbole and maybe it is a little bit, but it, it was almost like a, that loss kind of shook the foundation of what they thought this team was going to be a little bit. I don't, I really don't think anybody saw that coming. Uh, certainly on the offensive side with the way they played, certainly getting dominated on the boards the way they did. 
maybe you see that a little bit just from the exhibition games, but there wasn't a person over there that thought Nebraska was going to look like that in their first game. And so now you've had a couple of days to practice. You've got a tough game tonight against Sam Houston. And then guess who comes to town Tuesday? Creighton, um, you know, and, and a Creighton game that you thought might be winnable before the season all of a sudden looks a lot tougher. Creighton 2-0 and with a couple come from behind wins. Creighton hasn't been great. They've been good enough. And so, yeah, it's a <laughs> for game two on November 12th uh, in a 31-game season, about as much intrigue as you could want uh, playing a team from the Southland Conference for Nebraska. So going to be really interesting to see what that looks like tonight. So Sam Houston State has a, a win against a Division three team, Letourneau. Is that what it is? Letourneau, yeah. yeah. Um, Sam Houston State has a, has a forward um, who transferred in from Texas A&M and started two years at Texas A&M. Averaged about nine points and seven rebounds a game at Texas A&M. So they did it at a high level. They got an all-conference guard coming back who shot 40% from three-point range. This is a team that won 14 or won 19 games last year. This is no, this is no you know, Prairie View A&M coming in here. This is no Mississippi Valley State. This is a legit good program that has a has an identity and they play to it. And you know, Trey McAllen said the money quote the other night. They shoot the ball just to go rebound. So so you know they're going to crash and they're going to crash hard. And they look, they watched the film on Nebraska. They saw what it looked like. You can bet those coaches are telling those guys, look, these dudes are soft. We can go get the board on them. We can put it back and we can dominate them that way. So yeah, it's going to be a, a huge, huge test for Nebraska. Man, it's not, I mean, I don't, you don't want to overreact because you teams don't. get upset this time of year and there were upsets on the night Nebraska got, got upset. But yeah, yeah, but Baz, it's an interesting discussion because you you don't want to underreact either. Yeah. You know, I and, and the again, I, I wouldn't overreact and I'm not trying to, just the way that Fred Hoiberg sounded in that post game, it just really struck me. Just his tone of voice, his mannerisms. He sounded and looked like a coach that was, and I don't want to, again, I don't want to judge what's in his head or anything, but he sounded like a coach that was shook up a little bit by what he saw and wasn't expecting what he saw. When, so, you, when you say, when you say that line, he had that line about we can either pout uh, and go away or, or bounce back. I mean, that, that sounds like something you say in the middle of a tough, of yes. you know, a rugged stretch in February. Yeah. Yeah. Not like opening night about saying, I hope we have the energy and the want to, to bounce back from this. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that was, that was concerning too. That was kind of the money quote from the press conference too. It was like, you're saying that after 40 minutes of basketball in your entire season, after your first 40 minutes of basketball. This you know, season. that's, it's interesting. I, it's possible that Fred was surprised. I mean, I think you're right. You, I saw the press conference. He was shook. I don't know about surprise though. I mean, I know that in their last scrimmage that the, you know, their first unit lost to the second unit, which isn't, that's not a, yeah. a, 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 a terribly odd occurrence. It happens, but I don't know. I, I don't know. I, this is, we're just, it's just going to be sort of an ongoing uh, it is conversation the about this team. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say the rebounding is going to be an issue all year. Um, it's been an issue since Fred got here, basically. Um, and, and I don't think anybody expects that Nebraska to win on the boards every night or even most nights. But if you're not going to do that, you need to be really, really good on offense. And Nebraska was really, really bad on offense the other night. And they got him beat. So yeah. it's you got to make for, up for it in other areas. And Nebraska didn't do that. The other night. Well, the other stat, Baz, that you pointed out is they had six assists on the night. And had five one in the of first them. half. Yeah. yeah, one one in the first half and five by one player, Alonzo Verge. Now, I'm going to tell you something right now. I've been looking at box scores for 45 years, and you seldom see that. One yeah. assist for – okay, you have five assists for one player and then one assist across the rest of the team. That's an incre- – that's a remarkable statistic. Yeah. That's remarkable. Yeah. That's, that's, where, that's where it's at right now. Um, we need to kind of wrap this podcast up. I've got a, a another engagement coming up here. So real quick, wrap it. The, the, the breaking news from baseball, Chase Mason, the highly touted outfielder who has left the program, he's going to pursue football in college. This was the kid that came in from South Dakota as a stud athlete, uh, Tate met elite power, um, elite speed, enough so that it, he was invited to the MLB draft combine this summer, had interest from MLB scouts. There was some concern he might not make it to campus to begin with. 
because he might get drafted. Not get drafted, came to Nebraska, had some impressive shots, had some impressive home runs in their intra squad games. There's a, I've heard, I've heard rumblings that he hit one over the scoreboard at Haymarket Park uh, in one of their, in one of their <laughs> inter squad scrimmages, but really struggled in the, in the red white series, went 0 for 10 with nine strikeouts, struggled to adjust to college pitching. So Chase Mason moving on, that that certainly hurts. And he was the number three rated prospect in that in that 2021 recruiting hmm. class. So kind of the kind of the, really the first bad recruiting news Will Bolt's gotten since he's been there, which is pretty remarkable uh, in in the in the era we live in now. So that's going to wrap it up for us. Thanks guys for tuning in. We'll be back next week. Wisconsin on the docket. We'll talk to you next time.